Hello everyone, I'm Magic Dave and this is Sapiens. Um, as you can see, this guy is uh, going for a little jog. Um, that's what I've been working on. I've just sort of started on that over the last couple of days. Um, just, just getting a few different variations in the way that they're moving. I've got um, a sneak animation and a, and a running and a, a sort of slow walk. Um, and yeah, I'm only really, I've only really just started, but um, yeah, it's going quite well and I'll go into um, exactly uh, what I've done there so far. Um, yeah, they've just slowed down now because it's sort of run out of energy. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the first thing though that I wanted to talk about is that I just wanted to revisit the whole sort of multi-select thing. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of um, comments about it and uh, I felt really that I needed to respond um, to, to what everyone's been saying. So in the last YouTube video, there were lots and lots of comments about this uh, multi-select interface. Uh, lots of people suggest making different suggestions about what they thought I could do to improve this, or basically to replace it. Um, and honestly, I'm not I'm not planning on replacing it. I actually really like it. I think it's really good. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's really interesting because obviously because it was so varied, it just shows that everyone's got their own idea of how they think that um, multi-select should work. Um, and yeah, there was really no consensus at all. There were a number of ideas that just weren't at all feasible for various reasons and you know most of them are things that I haven't talked about or that you couldn't have known but you know there are just interactions that wouldn't have worked. Um, but then there were also quite a few that would, that suggested top-down interactions so um, you know show, basically when you when you clicked on something to get into multi-select that it would um, zoom you up and show the cursor and then allow you to interact uh, basically like any other top-down game. Now I definitely considered this, um, I did give it quite a lot of thought before I started implementing this view here um, and what it all came down to was my aversion to turning this into a top-down game. It's my belief that if I did implement multi-select in a top-down view with the cursor vi visible like this that people would not be happy with that. Um, that wouldn't be enough, uh, that would be too familiar to people who are used to playing top-down real-time strategy or city builder games and immediately you'd want to do a whole lot more. You'd really want to be able to queue up actions for everything from that view. You'd want to be able to tell people to be able to move places. Uh, you'd, want to, you'd want to be able to place building structures and basically do everything from above. And I'm sorry, but that's not what this game is about. Um, you know, that was, um, uh, there was a fork in the road probably about three, four years ago now where I decided to take the immersive um, first person camera route. I'm far too far along development now to even consider uh, going back to doing a top down game, even if I, even if I wanted to, uh, which I very definitely don't. So anyway, that's that's basically my reasoning for why I went the way I did with the with the multi-select thing. And um, yeah, I mean, hopefully you agree and can kind of understand my reasoning. Um, but if not, then there's always the chance for someone to make a mod. It'd be pretty easy to make a mod that um, did do this top-down view with um, uh, showing the cursor for multi-select. So um, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe someone will do that, and and you can give it a go anyway. Okay, so uh, yeah, so I've got a little sort of jog animation. Um, yeah, I've, I've been really sort of refining the code to try to um, allow me to create these animations a bit quicker. And I've also been, um, you know, figuring out my workflow for creating animations because I've sort of, you know, I've made tentative efforts on it all, but I've, I'd only got so far. So I thought I'd show you how I've gone about creating these new animations. The first step is that I've um, recorded myself running uh, in, this is my office, so this is me. Um, so I've recorded myself uh, doing these actions and I can just use this as a reference. So it doesn't have to be great, it can be you know, pretty, um, pretty average quality running, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter, but it's, it's just a reference so I can get some idea of where arms and, and legs and stuff go. Uh, I basically just bought two really cheap little cameras, uh, webcams, and I'm using OBS to record. Uh, the um, the video footage at the same time so I can look at both both angles and figure out where everything is uh, so I guess this is sort of like your cheapest studious motion capture that you could possibly imagine um, but it's you know working for me so I use that as reference and I put that on one monitor and then on another monitor I've got um, a blender so in blender I basically have one model file um, it's this is the the male animation model file I then sort of copy and paste these um, into the female and the child models and sort of modify them a little bit if they need to Weaking. But yeah, the basic kind of procedure is for me to add new keyframes. Um, this this model file just contains a whole bunch of keyframes. They're not actually animations as such. Uh, the animations are defined in a script. 
Um, so yeah, I, I would add new keyframes for the new animation. Um, in this case, there's eight new keyframes for the running animation. And then in the um, script, uh, I need to add them in, into here. And then, um, and then I can um, configure how they're actually um, combined, what duration is between them. Uh, I can configure the easing in between different keyframes and also um, add things like triggers that play sounds and stuff like that too. Uh, so as far as actually rigging up each keyframe goes, um, it's pretty standard sort of rigging stuff. Uh, you know, I'd probably just copy and paste another um, keyframe from somewhere else that's sort of close, and then I'll just start dragging stuff around, um, sort of rotating around various axes and stuff to try to um, get the, the pose to match the keyframe that I'm looking at in the reference footage. Um, and then I'll load it up and see how terrible it looks. And in fact, my first um, attempt at a sneak was, uh, you know, pretty pretty humorous. Uh, but, you know, it, it looks bad to start with. And then you sort of tweak things and slowly refine it and, and you get there. Um, I think my skills in this have already progressed massively just in the last few days. And what's basically going to happen is by the time I get to the end of this development, um, I'll be much better and I'll be coming back and probably redoing all of these animations that I'm doing in these early stages. I also did quite a lot of work on the kind of interpolation between the the keyframes in the engine. Uh, the walking before was, a lot of people have actually commented that it was a bit a bit robotic looking. And I mean, you know, it's, it's not gonna be perfect. I'm still learning how to animate and how to best sort of get the, the most out of my engine that I can. Um, and I've got limited resources, you know, it's just me and I've only, I can only really allow myself a few weeks to work on all the, all the animations in the game. So, um, you know, I'm competing with AAA studios that have whole teams working for years. So <laughs> there's, you know, there's only so much I can do, but um, you know, I, I'm relatively happy with this. I think that it fits with the game okay. And yeah, I'm quite happy with my workflow. I think I should be able to create um, a number of different animations fairly quickly. Um, so these guys are on a food raid and they're sort of running in. Um, I'm going to make it so that they sort of spot other your sapiens and kind of stop or, or start sneaking around if they're within a certain radius and stuff like that. So um, I'll actually probably work on that really soon. Uh, I also want to work on a, a number of the other animations and, and just tidy everything up on, um, you know, relating to all of their behaviors and, and animations and everything. So um, I think I've probably got a good couple of weeks here of, of really just working on animations and behaviors. So um, yeah, that's what I'm gonna be working on next. Cool, so it's been about a week since I recorded that last segment and I have not managed to get them sneaking when they're on food raids. And I think that might actually wait a little bit longer now. Um, I'll go into more of that in a minute. Uh, but I have done quite a lot and I've really focused a lot on uh, the, the individual kind of sapien behaviors and um, their, their moods and things. So I'll show you a bit of that. Um, and I also worked a bit on sort of network um, optimization. So I'll talk a bit, a bit about that too. So let's just create a new world and uh, that will do. And we'll just see what we end up with here. Um, the sapiens um, previously um, they had these uh, traits assigned to them, but they didn't actually mean anything. Whereas now I've actually done the work to, uh, to make these um, traits all have sort of some kind of effect. So um, they, they will influence the skills, they influence where, um, how hungry they get, how much sleep they need, um, how old they are also um, influences their sleep needs and things. Um, so it's all just uh, been fleshed out a whole lot more. Um, let me just find something not quite so snowy. Um, okay, so this tribe looks um, kind of interesting. We've got a sort of variety of um, different personality traits. So let's lead this tribe. Cool, so let's, I'll just queue up a few orders and things and we'll get them um, getting some food maybe. Um, so yeah, they, they now get uh, tired and what tends to happen is they've got a lot of energy right at the start and then um, so they're, they're all sort of running around off to kind of do things. Um, but then by the end of the day they'll be tired and they'll start sort of sitting around and, and having rests and stuff. Um, let me just, I'll queue up a bunch of orders and just get them sort of started so that we can start to see some, some behaviours emerge. Okay, so we're ne near the end of that first day and um, you'll see that a couple of them are actually sitting down now. Um, so yeah, that's totally new. They'll, they'll sit down when they want to rest. Um, they've got a few different poses, I think. Uh, yeah, I don't know, that's sort of okay, but uh, some of the poses have, you know, need a bit of work. But um, the yeah, the, that's all based on their needs. So they've got a rest need and they've got a sleep need. Um, so rest is just if they're sort of physically tired or mentally tired, then they'll, they'll just sort of have a sit down and have a break. It's sort of a recreation need, I suppose. 
uh, whereas sleepers actually if they, they want to go to sleep um, and yeah the, the um, combination of all of their needs uh, will affect their um, happiness score over time and um, their icons are now coloured I might actually change them to be a graphical representation of their mood too that was sort of always um, my intent to have a mood indicator above them like this and yeah so if they if their mood gets too bad then they'll start just moping around and refuse to do any work and if they get yeah obviously if they get tired then they'll all sort of sit around and um, and rest so that's uh, that's nice now I thought I would do that stuff because uh, when I started thinking about um, how they should behave uh, towards each other it uh, really seemed that I should actually get them to um, you know have some behaviors that are driven by their own uh, needs and wants and personalities first that sort of made more sense um, so that's why I focused on that and yeah I think um, I think I will uh, sort of go into their um, their interactions with each other quite soon but again as I was, I was talking about um, in the the last sort of segment of the video I was saying that I probably wanted to get them sort of sneaking around when they come in on food raids and stuff but it doesn't really make sense to work on that before they even interact with each other so that's really what's missing right now is that they completely ignore each other um, you know and it feels like they're a bunch of individuals just doing their own thing um, so it's really important that I work on that soon. So also I've been working on delta compression for the multiplayer network state so I thought I should just explain how multiplayer works in Sapiens a little bit too because I think probably most of you don't even know that it supports multiplayer, uh, but it very much does. Now, um, so the um, game is always running um, a server and, um, and a client. Um, in multiplayer, you've got a separate server on a different machine. Um, I've got an Ubuntu uh, build of that, as well as a Windows command line application. So you can run a separate server and have multiple clients connecting via a network. Um, but in single player, both of these are just running on a single machine. Um, and in fact, they're both running in the same process. And instead of using a network, we've just got a thread safe queue that basically lets, lets the client and server um, communicate internally within the process. So this is a really good design. Um, if we wanted to then add another client, we could easily do so, um, just create a network interface here, and, um, and then they can just um, communicate uh, via that interface. Um, so this is basically a local area network connection that you've just opened up, and you can have multiple clients connecting. Um, so yeah, it supports both um, local area network as well as sort of client server, um, and of course, just uh, single player as well. So this is a really good way to design um, a multiplayer game. Uh, the previous game that I made was um, The Blockheads. It was a single player game to start with and then I tried to add multiplayer in um, after the fact and it was a lot of hard work and there were a lot of bugs all the way through um, and it actually made it very difficult to add new content um, in the later sort of stages of um, the game's life. So I would not recommend doing that. Um, if you want to support multiplayer, design it that way right from the start and design it like this so that it's always split into a server and client because then when you're testing single player, you're, you're testing 90% of what multiplayer is anyway. You've still got that separation. So anyway, I spent um, about three days optimizing the, um, the data that was sent across, um, particularly to do with Sapiens. So, so a Sapien has um, a lot of state associated with it. Um, it has a name, um, a position, uh, it has potentially a path um, which can have multiple positions. Um, it has, what else, it has needs and um, uh, wants. Um, it has uh, moods and it has, uh, I don't know, the list just keeps going on and on. So the problem was that it was sending through the entire state across to the client and of course you know that, that state was getting bigger all the time and it was really going to use a lot of network bandwidth um, and it's, it's unnecessary. So the solution was to track changes of individual um, state items within this. And so if I then if I changed the position, then um, it could you know, mark that as changed. And then when it goes to send the state through to the client, it could just send that position or you know position and wants if, if both of those changed um, into a, and um, just not worry about sending all this other stuff that stayed the same. Now on the surface that seems extremely simple, um, but the problem was that the server was just uh, just changing the state whenever it felt like um, at various points throughout the um, code and uh, there was just no way to track what what had changed without actually comparing this against the previous um, the previous state. And uh, you know that was an option. I decided that the better solution was probably to actually track the changes as I changed them. So that's what I did. I added a um, you know change state function. Um, actually, no, it was 
added a set function and a remove function. Um, and so you could say set uh, pos, um, you know, x, y, z. And then that would then say that this has changed and then we'd be able to just send that through. Um, so the real problem was um, I had to go through and find every single place where the server modified that state and replace it with a function. And of course, um, <laughs> that can be it can be tricky, especially when you've got nested state. Um, there were places where it was rearranging nested tables within other tables, um, all sorts of stuff going on. So I had to really tidy all of that up. Um, and yeah, the only way that I could really make sure that I'd fixed it was to, um, on the client, verify the delta updates with um, a full changed uh, version of the state and um, yeah it took probably uh, there were probably about 30 things that I'd missed or screwed up um, and it, I had to go through each one and when it printed out uh, an error message saying that the states didn't match um, I had to find out why um, so yeah that was a bit of fun for three days there but you know it needed to be done it's been on my to-do list for a good couple of years and it's um, yeah good to have that done and I just thought you might be interested in, in a little bit of the more technical kind of um, side of how things work there and you know the process that I went through and yeah hopefully I don't have to look at any of that code again Okay, so it's the next morning and I just wanted to show you uh, how I've started work on, you know, their interactions with each other. Um, again, uh, just like with their sort of um, individual behaviours of, you know, how they're sitting and stuff and how it's, that's driven by their own um, moods and needs and things, um, I thought that their behaviours with each other should be driven by their individual kind of relationships with each other. And so first I needed to come up with some kind of basic model for, for relationships. So I sort of sat down and and thought about that for a bit and I really you know it, it's interesting because it's like you know I don't have a psychology major maybe maybe someone watching this does and can <laughs> help out a little bit um, but I really wanted a really nice simple model that was complex enough still to be able to give some really nice sort of believable behaviors between them and uh, what I've come up with so far is if I just click on one of these um, I have uh, split it out into a bond and a mood so basically bond is, is sort of a long-term sort of attachment um, so all of the people within the tribe have a reasonable kind of bond score and then mood is more like a, whether you like or dislike someone so um, yeah parents and kids are really tightly bond and then they're, they're sort of got a nice bond with their uh, other people in the tribe um, if they if they see someone that doesn't belong to their tribe then they will have zero bond um, and in fact here's a couple over here I don't know if um, I don't know if they've seen them let's have a look um, no, they haven't seen them yet. So if they do notice them, then they should get uh, a zero bond score, um, which would cause them to then behave differently. They, they don't know who they are, they know nothing about them, so they'll behave very cautiously towards each other. Uh, yeah, so that's the plan. Um, and also it means that if they don't, if they don't, if they're having a, an argument and they don't like each other, um, they'll still fight for each other when it comes down to it because they have that bond. So I thought that was nice splitting it out. Um, so also if I look at this, uh, there are two values for bond and two for moods. So um, the, uh, that's long term and short term. Um, yeah, in fact, that's long term and that's short term. So the short term will be influenced by how they interact and you know events that happen, and then that will slowly influence the long term as well. Um, and I thought that that made sense. They might have a little fight, but overall they still like each other really. Um, so yeah, I don't know. We'll see how this goes. I think it is kind of it's nice and simple, and yet probably enough to really um, drive some interesting behaviours. So we'll see. But obviously, I haven't started on the behaviours yet. You know, it's still early days, and I decided instead of really um, going forward with that any further um, I would really like to add more content um, the, the problem is that all these things take a long time to test because you're sitting and watching their behaviors evolve over long periods of time and um, you know I don't want to just sit around waiting and watching um, only that I think that I can multitask a bit better than that and actually test some of the the things that they can build and stuff too um, so yeah that's quite exciting because it means that basically next week I'm planning on um, starting work on um, adding some new content finally so some new um, some new tech some new structures um, you know I don't know exactly yet maybe some maybe some animals and um, yeah 
um, just generally content. Okay, so I think I might just wrap up the video there. Um, it's, it's kind of a shame because this is quite a nice little tribe that I've got set up here. Um, but yeah, things are going quite well um, and yeah, I'm quite excited about all this new content that's just around the corner, hopefully, <laughs> unless I get distracted again. Uh, but anyway, we'll see you again in a, in a week or two and until then, uh, please don't forget to wishlist Sapiens on Steam and we'll catch you next time. Cheers.